Do you ever find yourself searching for something bigger than you? For a community to be a part of? A place founded on truth and love. A place to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Son of God. Welcome to Founded in Truth, where we're more than just a fellowship. We're a family, so welcome home. All right, well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It is a, it's a blessing to be with you all today. And um, by the way, I really mean that. It's a blessing to be with you all today. I know I say that a lot. I, that's just what I say when I come up here. But I want you to know that there is nowhere else I'd rather be today than with you guys on this Sabbath day here at FIT. Even if I weren't preaching and I was just sitting where you all are sitting, listening to Pastor Matthew preach like I do most Sabbaths, uh, I still wouldn't want to be anywhere else because I love you all very much and I'm just so grateful to be part of this community, this body of believers. So I wanted to say that and uh, <laughs> love you all very much. And so having said that, the title of my message today is The End of All Mankind, What Death Can Teach Us About Life. And we're going to go through a passage in the book of Ecclesiastes today. Ecclesiastes, for those of you who might not know, it's part of the wisdom literature in the Bible. And along with books like Proverbs and Job, uh, it, it's just part of this collection of writings known as wisdom literature. And so there are different views about who might have written Ecclesiastes. Traditionally, it's said to have come from Solomon. The opening verse in Ecclesiastes identifies the teacher as a son of David. So that's where the tradition comes from, that Solomon was the one who wrote this, although some people say it could have been another descendant of David or, or even, you know, a, just an Israelite teacher. But in either case, the teacher in the book is actually a character in the book. So there is the author of the book, and then there's the teacher. And the author introduces this teacher in the first verse, and then the teacher's message just kind of goes through the entire book uh, to just about the end, and then the author concludes the teacher's message at the end of the book. So the teacher's message in Ecclesiastes is summarized at the very beginning and toward the end of the book, and that message is pretty much this. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity, or meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. In Hebrew, that word is hevel, hevel, all is hevel, and, and hevel is usually translated or as meaningless or vanity, but that doesn't really capture the term. The, the Hebrew term signifies more of like a mere breath or smoke. All is smoke. And throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, there's just kind of this theme of futility. This idea that everything you do in life ultimately amounts to nothing. All of your accomplishments will be erased by the waves of time. A hundred years from now, Nobody is going to remember your Instagram account. Nobody is going to care about the things that you spent your time, so much of your time doing. And to a lot of us in modern times, especially in the West, that message is kind of depressing, isn't it? But the teacher's point is not really to expose a lack of meaning or significance in life, but rather to point to the fact that there is true meaning found elsewhere. 
That is to say, true meaning in this life is not in the things that we tend to pursue out of self-fulfillment in this life, our career, whatever it may be. No true meaning is found in something that transcends this temporal realm, this temporal existence, namely the fear of the Lord and the reality of something beyond this life. So we're going to talk about death today. We're going to talk about death, and this is a topic that I think is very uncomfortable for most of us. It's something that I think most of us want to avoid as much as possible, if we're honest. But I think it's important that we talk about this. And um, do you all mind if I share my heart a little bit? Okay, well, uh, I was going to do it anyway, but I'm glad I have your permission. Um, I've been feeling pretty heavy this whole week. There were two mass shootings that happened last weekend, as you all know. There was one in El Paso, Texas, and the other in Dayton, Ohio. And after learning about these shootings, I've just been kind of walking around in a fog. And I found myself feeling very angry, very upset. I found myself weeping as I've read testimonies of the survivors of these shootings and I've read stories about people who have sacrificed their lives trying to save others. There was a story of a a 25-year-old mother, that's my wife's age, she's a 25-year-old mother, but she, uh, this 25-year-old mother, she sacrificed her life saving her little baby boy, a two-month-old baby boy. And reading all of this uh, about these shootings that happened, it got me thinking a lot about how short life really is, that, that it could be taken just like that. Evil people could take your life, or it might not even be through an evil person. It might just be that you die in a car accident. You could die in a car accident today or tomorrow. It's, it's the reality. We have to face it. Life is short. Life is fleeting. And my wife and I, we spent a lot of time talking this week about death and how it has affected us. We've spent a lot of time talking about the shootings that happened and, and just talking about the pain of it all. And you might think that's morbid. Why would you spend so much time talking about death and pain and sadness? And but for me, thinking about and talking about death put things in perspective Because like I said, I I think that most of us are inclined to avoid this topic. That's why when a shooting happens, typically everyone immediately jumps to politics. Everyone on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, we all get on our social media accounts and find some detail about these tragedies that we can exploit and use against our political rivals. It's an easy distraction from the pain. And what we do, it's actually really disturbing, is we treat these tragedies like a game. We retreat to our teams, okay? And then we kick the political football around in order to try to score points against the other side. There were two shootings that happened, right? Uh, Apparently the first one that that happened in El Paso, Texas, it was carried out by an anti-immigrant white supremacist, an evil person. And so as you would expect, a bunch of people on the political left rushed the political football to the end zone to score points against the right. Oh, the shooter was radicalized by President Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric, and he incited all of this hatred against immigrants, and it's the, the right's immigration policies. That's what is to blame here. And that's been the narrative, right? And coincidentally, 
the right's not off the hook because evidently the Dayton, Ohio shooter was a radical leftist Elizabeth Warren fan. So as you would expect, as you would expect, those on the right kicked the political football to score a field goal against the left. It's because of the left's views. They radicalized this person. They're to blame. Vote for us. And back and forth and back and forth we go. And you know what's disturbing about it all? What's disturbing about it all is that people online almost become giddy. They almost become giddy when they discover that a mass shooter held political beliefs opposite of them because now they have a tool that they can use against people online. What an empty, shallow people that we are that we would immediately react that way to these tragedies. What an empty, shallow people we are. And I'm just going to say this. You gave me permission to share my heart. So I'm just going to say this. If your immediate reaction to these shootings was to see how you might use them to dunk on your political rivals online, rather than mourning the loss of these people, you should be ashamed of yourself. Politics, of course, is just one distraction. There are many other distractions that we retreat to instead of dealing with the pain, but the reason we do this is that the reality of death is a threat to our little bubble, our safe little bubble. Remaining detached and distracted with all of the endless political debates, all of the media, all of the entertainment, all of the things where we can just veg and zone out. It's easier than dealing with the reality of death. It doesn't hurt as much. It doesn't hurt as much. But that type of attitude, according to the Bible, is foolish. That type of way of dealing with these things is foolish according to Ecclesiastes. If you read Ecclesiastes, the teacher, he did it all. He engaged in all the distractions that life has to offer. Riches, women, pleasure, success. He had it all. He got it all. He obtained it all. And yet, at the end of the day, he says that it's all meaningless. It's all meaningless. We're all going to die. We're all going to be forgotten. Your political football game is meaningless. It doesn't matter. It's foolish. What are you doing? So how do we truly grasp what really does matter in this life and stop wasting time on what doesn't matter? Well, if you want to turn with me or swipe with me if you're on your phone, we're going to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And I think the author, I'm just going to assume the author is Solomon. I think the author has some insights that will help us make the most of this gift of life that we've been given. So we're going to start in chapter 7, verse 1. This is what it says. He says, a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. So a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. So what is he saying here? Essentially, what he's saying is that it's better to have a good name than it is to have expensive things. It's better that you have good character than all of the awesome stuff. Why? Why is it better to have a good name? What's the big deal about a good name? Because at the end of your life, all that matters is who you are. At the end of your life, all that matters is who you are, your character, how much you love, how much you gave, how much time you spent with your children, how much compassion you showed toward others how dependable you are, how good of a friend you are, how good of a spouse you were, how good of a parent you were. 
Nobody at your funeral is going to talk about your nice car. Nobody at your funeral is going to talk about your nice corner office that you worked so hard to get. Do you ever think about your name? Do you think about your name or do you spend most of your time wasting your time? Thinking about how you can work to get your slice of the pie, the American dream. You got to get more money. You got to get the job that you want. You got to get the house that you want. All of the stuff that literally will not matter when you die. It won't matter. The verse says that the day of death is better than the day of birth. The day of death is better than the day of birth. Okay, so what is up with that? Because that just sounds crazy, right? It just sounds crazy. Nobody believes that. That's such a counter-cultural statement. Because in our culture, just think of it on a basic level. In our culture, we celebrate birth. Every single year on our birthdays, we throw a party. Not that that's wrong. It's, it's good to celebrate life too. When someone has a baby, that's an exciting time. Everyone is really excited. We take thousands of pictures and blast them all over social media. Everyone wants to come over and see the baby, and it's awesome. That should be celebrated. I'm not trying to take away from that. But Solomon says that the day of death is better. And what is our reaction when someone dies? When someone dies, I think most people just want to move on. We want to stop thinking about it. It's too painful. It's too hard. But according to Scripture, the day of death is better. The day of death is better. However, I want to qualify that because Solomon qualifies it in the first part of the verse. The day of death is only better for the one who had a good name. The day of death is only better for the one who had a good name. If you didn't have a good name, if you just died with a bunch of stuff, if you didn't have compassion, if you were selfish and cruel, I can understand your day of death not being such a very good day. Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy magazine, he was a rich, powerful, influential person. He had all of the money. He had all the women. He had the, the big mansion. He was famous. But he didn't have a good name, did he? He's dead now. And you know how we all remember him? As an old, creepy weirdo. <laughs> That's true. As an old, creepy weirdo, and worse, as someone who sexually exploited broken, vulnerable women, and someone who built his fortune off of exploiting women and destroying people's lives, destroying families. That's his legacy. The white supremacist who shot up the Walmart in El Paso. When he's executed, hopefully, we're not going to remember anything good about him. He's remembered as the person who killed innocent people. His day of death is not going to be a very good day for him, especially if he doesn't repent and come to terms with what he did and, and cries out to God for mercy before his day of death. It's going to be much, much worse. However, if you, if you did have a good name, if you lived your life well for God's glory, then the, your day of death is going to be better than when you were born. Yes, of course, it's sad. But that's the day that you enter the presence of the Lord. That's the day that you get to fully experience the love and joy of God, where, where true fulfillment and satisfaction is found, and you experience a joy that can't even be fully grasped in this lifetime. Let's keep going here. Verse 2 
says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. This is the end of all mankind. What's the end of all mankind? The house of mourning. So whether you're rich or poor, whether you are a successful CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a Walmart cashier, you're going to die. Face it, you are going to die. We all end up in the same situation. You're not too good to die. What jumps out at me about this verse is that Solomon says it's better. It's better to go to the house of mourning. So essentially what he's saying here is that spending time with those who are in pain, spending time with those who are grieving, those who are hurting, those who are crying, those people that are in the midst of death and loss, it's better to hang out with those people than it is to have fun at a party. Why? Because he says death is where we all end up. Death is where we all end up. It's the end of all mankind. It's not fun to think about, but it's good for our character. It's good for our heart to think about that, to deal with that, because it puts things in perspective. It helps us to really appreciate what actually matters in life. Solomon says that we are to lay this to heart. We are to lay this reality that you are going to die to lay it to heart. In other words, it ought to affect us. It ought to affect us emotionally, and it ought to change our thinking. In Hebrew, the word for heart, which is lev or levav, it reflects your intellectual activity, where you make your decisions. The ancient Hebrews actually thought that your heart was the source of your thoughts and your feelings. So when Solomon says that we are to lay this reality, this truth to heart, it should affect our thinking. Moreover, it should affect our decisions. When you make a decision, you should think about it in light of the fact that you are going to die someday. Should we really move here? Should I really take this job? Should I really get life insurance? Yes, by the way, you should. But that can even apply to smaller decisions. Should I really be spending all of this time binge-watching this show on Netflix? Should I take a break for five minutes and dance with my daughter? My, I, I work from home, and, and sometimes my three-year-old daughter, she'll, she'll knock on the door, and, and of course, you know, it's always when I'm right in the middle of a, a, a deep thought, I'm concentrating really hard, but she'll knock on the door, and she'll be like, Daddy, Daddy, I want to have a dance party. I want to have a dance party. Because she likes to come into my office, and then I'll turn music on the computer, and then she, we'll, we'll dance. So, you know, I, I've been taking her up on those opportunities because you know, someday she's not going to want to have dance parties with Daddy in his office. So do the things that you spend the most time on, do they really matter? Do they really matter? Let's keep going here. Verse 3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. All right, so I'm starting to get a little bit concerned about Solomon here because these sound like lyrics to what you might hear from an early 2000s emo band. You know, he, <laughs> we don't really believe what the Bible says here, that sorrow is better than laughter. What are you talking about? Nobody likes sorrow. We like laughter. Laughter's fun. We're all laughing. It's way better than crying. But according to Solomon, sorrow is to be valued. There's value in sorrow. And yet, we often treat sorrow as a problem to be fixed. Do you realize that? 
That's, how, that, that's often how we treat sorrow, as a problem to be fixed. What is our reaction when someone is crying you know, or someone is upset next to us? Usually our reaction is to say, don't cry. Usually our reaction is to say, cheer up, or to try to make them feel better, right? Try to get them to stop. We try to fix it because sorrow is uncomfortable. But Solomon says that sorrow is good, that a sad face is good for the heart. It's good to allow ourselves to be sad around each other. Do you know that? It's good to allow ourselves to be sad around each other. We moved to a new apartment recently, and uh, we've actually gotten to be pretty good friends with one of our new neighbors. He's a younger guy around my age. And I've only hung out with him a couple of times, but those times have been just really meaningful and just really impactful, actually. The first time we hung out was a few weeks ago, and he told me about how he's just been really busy and and really depressed because he's had to attend several funerals over the past month, several people that he's known, uh, family members and close friends, they've died just in a short amount of time. And so he's been dealing with that, and and so he brought that up. And then after he brought it up, he actually apologized. He's like, I'm sorry, man. You know, we just met, and I don't want to bring you down. You know, we, we can talk about something else. But I knew that he needed to talk about it. I knew that he needed to talk about it. So I said, dude, don't worry about it. You know, I know that we just met, but I'm here for you. And if you need to talk, let's talk. And so we talked. We hung out again a little over a week ago. And again, we started talking about just all of this really heavy stuff going on in his life. And and he's, he's had a really hard life growing up. He told me stories about abuse and and other hard things that he's had to deal with. And we just talked about it all. And I shared my perspective, of course, as a believer, because that's the only perspective I have (laughs) as a believer. And, And I just tried to comfort him as much as I could. He isn't a believer, by the way. He's he's not a Christian, he told me. But um we just talked about all of this and eventually he told me that he he didn't really have anyone else that he could talk to about this stuff. You know, he, of course, has friends that he hangs out with, but he can't really talk to them, he says. And he said that it just felt really good to talk about everything that he was going through rather than ignoring his feelings and and just keeping things on a surface level, as, as we all tend to like to prefer, just to keep things on a surface level. Small talk. Nothing, nothing that will make me feel vulnerable, right? Amazingly, after our long conversation, the last time we hung out, before he left, you know what he said to me? He, he actually, he asked me to pray for him. He, the non-Christian, was the one who initiated that time of prayer, He was the one that suggested we pray. And it's all because we were real. We allowed ourselves to be real. We actually had a meaningful discussion about things that matter. Sad, uncomfortable, painful things. We had that conversation. And that's what opened the door for ministry and for healing to take place for this young man. We could have just played video games. How, how would that have turned out? I could have just, I could have allowed him to say, you know, yeah, you're right. Let's, let's not talk about that. Let's play video games. Let, let, let's talk about something else that's not as heavy. But instead we talked. Are we able to be real with each other in this community? I, are you able to be real with the people in this community, just ask yourself that. Because I kind of think like a lot of us don't feel like we can, just being honest. You know, we, there's sort of like this pressure that we have to pretend to be happy or we have to pretend to be okay. I don't know if any of you guys have ever felt that. 
where did this idea come from that Christians are supposed to be happy all the time? Because that isn't a biblical idea. It's not a biblical idea. In fact, it's directly contrary to the Bible, according to what we just read, that sorrow is better than laughter, right? And there's entire books of the Bible dedicated to sorrow and pain and tragedy and lament. There's an entire book called Lamentations that's a lament, crying out in pain and agony and despair. It's my prayer that people will feel safe to be sad in this community. That's my prayer. My prayer is that you will feel safe to be sad in this community. That you won't feel pressured to have to hide how you really feel. Because deep down, although it might be more comfortable on the surface, deep down, nobody likes to be fake. We all crave deep, meaningful relationships. We all crave something deeper than the superficial. Beyond that, you know, there's a special place in God's heart for hurting people. What does his word say? His, his word says that he is near to the brokenhearted. He, is, he saves the crushed in spirit. We, we try to rob people of that intimacy with the Lord when we discourage them from being real. We're to mourn with those who mourn. That's what we're commanded to do. That's what Yeshua did. And we're messianics, right? We're all about doing what Yeshua did. He kept the Sabbath. He kept the feast days, so we should too. Guess what else he did? He mourned with those who mourned. This is what it says in in John chapter 11. This is after Lazarus died and Yeshua visited the community of people that were mourning Lazarus. This is what it says in John chapter 11, verse 33, he says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept, so that the Jews said, See how he loved him. Jesus wept. Wow, so much Those two simple words, so much power in those two simple words. When Yeshua saw the people weeping over Lazarus, he was deeply moved to the point of tears. He was mourning with those who mourned. What's interesting about this passage is if you keep reading, Yeshua already knew that Lazarus would soon be raised from the dead. Of course he did. And yet... He still wept. He still wept in light of that knowledge that he was soon going to be raised from the dead. You know, as believers, we know that there will be a future resurrection. We know that there is hope for life after death. We know that believers who have died, that they are in the presence of the Lord. And we can have hope in that, and that is a very powerful hope. That is a very powerful hope that we can hold on to. And yet, we can still acknowledge the pain of it all. And that's okay that death is painful and that we can experience that and admit it. Verse 4. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. So in other words, listen to the wise rebuke of Solomon here. Listen to the wise rebuke of Solomon here. We ought to be spending time thinking about death We ought to be spending time with each other, having those difficult conversations. It's not easy. It's painful, but it's good. Are you cultivating those deep, meaningful relationships with others in your community? Or are you, you know, out of fear of being vulnerable or or whatever the reason may be, or you may think that you're too busy 
You just keep things on a surface level. It says, it is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Listening to the song of fools, it's much easier and comfortable, but it's not better, all right? This actually convicted me because I got to be honest, I thoroughly enjoy the song of fools, I love the Song of Fools. One of my favorite movies is Napoleon Dynamite. And if you've ever seen that movie, it is stupid. (laughs) It is stupid. But it's so funny, and I love it, and I just laugh and laugh at this movie. I could quote it line for line for you, probably. I'm in, you know, some chat groups on Facebook with some friends, and all we do is we just send funny YouTube videos to each other, just nonsensical stuff. And I just have a really weird sense of humor. And I love to laugh. And that's okay, you know, because Solomon also says earlier that there is a time to laugh. And so laughter is good. And I don't want to take away from that. But we spend a lot of time laughing. We spend a lot of time on those things. How much time do we spend on meaningful things. How much time, as I said earlier, how much time do we spend trying to foster deep, meaningful relationships with each other? How much time do you spend with your children? How much time do you spend with your spouse? Meaningful time, quality time, How much time do you spend with your friends? Meaningful time, quality time with your friends, not just staring at a glowing box or pushing buttons, scrolling on a screen. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Okay, so... We number our days, that's how we get a heart of wisdom. So the Bible not only speaks about sinful behavior, obviously, it also speaks against foolish behavior. So that means in addition to walking in holiness, keeping God's commandments, we are called to walk in wisdom. We are called to pursue wisdom. And one of the ways that we become wise, according to what we just read, is to think about our death. It's to number our days. It's to realize and lay it to heart that one day you are going to die. What are you doing with your life? Are you wasting your time chasing the wind? Or are you serving God, serving others? Ecclesiastes concludes with this final thought after the teacher gives this message that all is vanity, vanity, meaningless, hevel. The author of the book says, yes, you know, the the teacher had a, a, a lot of really good stuff to say and we ought to listen to his message. But then the author concludes with his final thought. And this is what he says. In chapter 12, starting in verse 13, he says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. One day you will stand before the throne of God and he will judge your every deed that you did on this earth. I suggest that you start taking life seriously and part of that means living it in light of the fact that you will die and that you will stand before God's throne. I suggest spending time in the house of mourning. That's where the heart of the wise are, in the house of mourning. Tonight actually begins a, uh, it's a Jewish holy day, a traditional holy day on the Jewish calendar, uh, Tisha B'Av, which is the ninth of Av. 
It's an annual day of mourning uh, for the destruction of the first and second temples. And uh, it, it's also, it commemorates all of the tragedies that, that have befallen the Jewish people over the centuries. And um, this day is observed by fasting and reading lamentations. It's a day of mourning, so it's not a happy time. It's not a joyful time. It's a time of mourning. And so I would ask you to consider, I would encourage you to spend some time in the house of mourning, you know, just for tonight and tomorrow, just for tonight and tomorrow, putting the distractions aside and spend some time in mourning. Spend some time thinking about death. Have some time of intentional, meaningful conversation with your spouse or a close friend. Spend some time with your children. Obviously, we, we don't let this sadness consume us. We don't let mourning consume us. There is a time for laughter. There is a time for joy. And we have a lot of reasons to be joyful. We have a lot of reasons to be happy. But I'm saying that we as a people in this culture, we don't spend enough time thinking about important things. And the important things are often the most painful things. And it's good for us to think about those things. Worship team, you can come back up. All right, so may God teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom, right? May we understand that this life is short and, and that we need to get our acts together. May we stop avoiding the painful and difficult conversations. May we learn to be vulnerable with each other and humble. When is the last time that you confessed your hidden sins to someone that you may be healed? Because that's what James says, right? Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Do you have any hidden sins in your life? God will judge those things. That's, that's what it says. He will bring every deed into judgment, even the hidden things. I suggest getting it out now, getting it over with now rather than on the day of judgment. Confess those things. There will be a, a prayer, people up here that will pray with you. And um, I encourage you guys to, to go to them. Pray that you may be healed. Confess that you may be healed. Well, I'm going to pray, and then if it's all right, I'd also like to bless you guys. And then uh, the worship team is going to, to sing. Heavenly Father, O oh God, you give and you take away. Life is in your hands. And you've given us this life, which is a gift. God, help us to make the most out of this life. Help us to focus more on the things that matter. Help us to stop wasting time on the things that don't matter. Oh God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would, would just guide them to you, that, that they would be overtaken by your love right now in this moment. Father, that they would come to know you in a deep way and a desire to follow you and desire to have this hope that is beyond death that we can hold on to. And God, I, I pray for everyone here that you would draw them into a place of intimacy, draw them into a deeper relationship with you. We love you, Father. We thank you and we praise you. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Right. Yevarechacha Adonai veishmerecha. Yaer Adonai panavalecha vichunecha. Yisa Adonai panavalecha viasimlecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant you his peace. Bishim Yeshua Hamashiach, Sar HaShalom, in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. 
Shalom, I'm Matthew Vanderels, and I hope you enjoyed this message. Founded in Truth exists to build a community that bears the image of God and lives the redeemed life only Yeshua gives. If this message impacted you or if this ministry has been a blessing to you, we would love to hear from you. Send us a message through our contact form on our website and let us know how God has used this ministry to edify your faith and relationship with Him. Don't forget to subscribe by clicking here. And if you'd like to donate to this ministry and be a part of what God is doing through it, you can donate through our website at www.foundernetruth.com or by clicking here. We thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to next time. Shalom.